Welcome back to the war. On the early morning of June 6, 1944, a massive armada of ships appeared off the coast of Normandy, France. This was D-Day, the largest amphibious invasion in history and the beginning of the end for Nazi Germany. But this operation, codenamed Operation Overlord, was more than just a military assault. It was a colossal gamble. Failure could have prolonged the war for years and left Europe under the grip of tyranny. Join us at Legacy of War as we take a deeper look through the meticulous planning, the brutal battles, and the heroic efforts that made D-Day a turning point in World War II. Before we start the video, don't forget to check out our selection of playlists. We cover other wars like Vietnam, the World Wars, as well as Viking and Roman times. We will also be adding to our collection soon. Make sure you like, subscribe, and let us know your thoughts in the comments. Now relax and enjoy the video. That's in order. The Road to D-Day Imagine planning the largest amphibious invasion in history where the fate of millions in the future of Europe hang in the balance. The journey to D-Day was fraught with challenges, secret meetings, and strategic genius. The seeds of D-Day were sown in the dark days of 1940 as Nazi Germany swept through Europe. By early 1944, Europe was a fortress under Nazi control. Britain stood alone against Hitler's war machine, and the need for a second front in Western Europe became increasingly clear. At the Tehran Conference in 1943, the Big Three, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin, agreed that a cross-channel invasion was essential. This decision set the wheels in motion for what would become the most ambitious military operation in history. The goal was to liberate France, weaken Germany's hold on Europe, and ultimately bring an end to the war. Operation Overlord, the plan. Months of planning, countless hours of training, and top-secret strategies all aimed at one goal, liberating Western Europe from Nazi tyranny. But how did the Allies prepare for such a colossal undertaking? Over the next months, over 156,000 troops from the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, and other Allied nations prepared for the largest amphibious invasion in history. Training was intense, simulating the brutal conditions they would face on the beaches of Normandy. Operation Overlord was a colossal undertaking, requiring planning and coordination among the Allied forces. Planners had to consider tides, weather, moon phases, and even the soil composition of the landing sites. Thousands of detailed maps were created, and intelligence gathered through espionage and aerial reconnaissance was crucial. The invasion would take place along a 50-mile stretch of the Normandy coast, divided into five sectors. Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, and Sword. The goal was to secure the beaches, establish a foothold in France, and then push inland to liberate Paris and, eventually, all of Europe. This plan relied on precise timing, intelligence, and the element of surprise. To ensure the success of D-Day, the Allies launched an elaborate deception campaign known as Operation Fortitude. This plan aimed to mislead the Germans about the invasion's location and timing. The Allies created a fictitious army complete with inflatable tanks and fake radio traffic, to convince the Germans that the invasion would occur at Pas de Calais, the narrowest point between Britain and France. General Dwight D. Eisenhower was appointed Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force. His leadership and ability to coordinate a diverse coalition were vital to the success of the operation. Eisenhower knew that the complexity of the invasion meant that even a small mistake could lead to disaster. The German Defenses the Germans were not idle. With formidable defenses stretching across Europe's coastlines, they were determined to repel any assault. But were they prepared for what was coming? While the Allies were planning the invasion, the Germans were fortifying their defenses along the Atlantic Wall, a series of coastal fortifications stretching from Norway to the French-Spanish border. Under the command of Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, the Germans placed obstacles on the beaches, laid mines, and constructed bunkers and gun emplacements. Rommel believed that the best chance to repel the invasion was to defeat the Allies on the beaches before they could establish a foothold. Rommel, known as the Desert Fox for his cunning in North Africa, personally inspected the defenses, 
ensuring that every possible measure was taken to fortify the coastline. Countdown to invasion. With everything meticulously planned and rehearsed, all that was left was the final go-ahead. But nature had its own plans, throwing one last curveball at the Allies. The date was set, June 5th, 1944. But a storm forced a delay, and the troops waited anxiously. Then, on the morning of June 6th, the order was given. The invasion was on. As dawn broke, over 5,000 ships and 11,000 aircraft crossed the English Channel. Their objective? Five beaches along the Normandy coast, codenamed Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, and Sword. The night before paratroopers and preparations, before the sun rose on D-Day, the battle had already begun in the skies. In the hours before the beach landings, the Allies launched an airborne assault to secure key positions behind enemy lines. Thousands of paratroopers from the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions, along with British and Canadian Airborne Forces, were dropped into Normandy. Their mission was to capture bridges, disrupt German communications, and prevent reinforcements from reaching the beaches. Meanwhile, the invasion fleet, consisting of over 5,000 ships and landing craft, began its final approach to the Normandy coast. The beach landings begin. The dawn of June 6, 1944, saw one of the most dramatic and pivotal moments in military history. The first wave of Allied soldiers faced a wall of fire and steel as they stormed the beaches of Normandy. The first wave of attack came from the air and sea. Bombing runs and naval bombardments aimed to soften the German defenses. However, many of the bombs missed their targets leaving key fortifications intact and ready to repel the invaders. The one 200-plane airborne assault preceded the amphibious landing and the naval bombardment commenced at 5.50 a.m., targeting key positions along the coast. At 6.30 a.m., the first landing crafts hit the beaches. The landings were divided among five sectors, Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, and Sword. Each beach faced different levels of resistance, and the experiences of the soldiers varied dramatically from one sector to another. Utah Beach Utah Beach, located on the Cotentin Peninsula, was the westernmost landing zone. The 4th Infantry Division, commanded by Brigadier General Theodore Roosevelt, Jr., landed approximately 2,000 yards south of their intended position due to strong currents. This unexpected deviation turned out to be advantageous, as the area was less heavily defended. Brigadier General Roosevelt famously declared, We'll start the war from here. The troops faced relatively light resistance, with only 197 casualties out of the 23,000 soldiers who landed. They quickly moved inland to link up with the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions, securing the beach by midday. Omaha Beach Omaha Beach, the most heavily defended, stretched over six miles and was the site of the fiercest fighting. The 1st and 29th Infantry Divisions faced intense machine gun fire, artillery, and obstacles as soon as they disembarked from their landing crafts. The German 352nd Infantry Division was well prepared and heavily fortified, making Omaha Beach a nightmarish battleground. Many landing crafts were destroyed before reaching the shore, and those who made it faced a deadly gauntlet. The beach was strewn with Belgian gates, Czech hedgehogs, and extensive minefields. Units were disorganized and commanders were killed or incapacitated. Despite the chaos, small groups of soldiers, displaying extraordinary bravery, began scaling the cliffs and taking out German positions one by one. By the end of the day, Omaha Beach saw over 2,400 casualties. But the tenacity and heroism of the Allied forces prevailed. Engineers cleared obstacles under fire and reinforcements steadily arrived to secure the beachhead, Gold Beach. Gold Beach, assigned to the British 50th Infantry Division, stretched for five miles. The landings were supported by specialized tanks, including the Hobart's Funnies, which played a crucial role in overcoming beach obstacles. The German 716th Infantry Division defended the area, but the British troops managed to secure their objectives despite facing moderate resistance. The British faced obstacles in fortified positions, but effective use of amphibious tanks and close naval gunfire support allowed them to advance. Key targets, such as the town of Aeromanche, were secured, paving the way for the construction of a Mulberry Harbor, an artificial port crucial for bringing in supplies and reinforcements. Juno Beach. 
Juneau Beach was the responsibility of the Canadian 3rd Infantry Division. The landings here were complicated by offshore reefs, which delayed the assault and exposed the landing crafts to intense fire. The initial resistance was heavy, with the first wave suffering around 50% casualties. Despite the initial heavy losses, the Canadians demonstrated remarkable resilience. They overcame strong points and cleared beach obstacles. By the end of the day, they had advanced further inland than any other Allied force, securing key positions and linking up with British troops from Gold Beach. Sword Beach. Sword Beach, the easternmost landing zone, was targeted by the British 3rd Infantry Division. The objective was to secure the beach and advance towards Caen, a critical city for controlling the region. The landings faced moderate resistance from the German 716th Infantry Division. The British utilized amphibious tanks and specialized vehicles to clear obstacles and neutralize strong points. They advanced quickly, meeting the 6th Airborne Division, which had captured key bridges and positions inland. However, the advance towards Caen was slowed by strong German counterattacks, leading to prolonged and fierce fighting. Securing the beaches. The initial landings were just the beginning. The true test lay in securing the beaches and establishing a foothold in Normandy. Every inch of ground was contested fiercely. By nightfall on June 6, 1944, despite facing intense resistance and sustaining heavy casualties, the Allies had secured all five beachheads. But the mission was far from over. The immediate task was to link these isolated beachheads into a continuous front and secure a firm foothold in Normandy. This required rapid consolidation and movement inland, often against fierce German counterattacks. The Allies quickly set about constructing two artificial mulberry harbors at Gold Beach and Omaha Beach to facilitate the rapid offloading of men, vehicles, and supplies. The pipelines under the Ocean Project was also initiated, laying underwater pipelines to pump fuel from England to France, ensuring the advancing forces remain supplied with critical resources. Securing a deep water port was crucial for the Allies. The capture of Cherbourg was vital, and after intense fighting, the city fell on June 26, 1944, providing a significant logistical advantage. Meanwhile, the battle for Caen, a primary objective for the British forces, turned into a protracted and bloody engagement. The city was finally liberated on July 20, 1944, after weeks of bitter urban warfare. Beyond the initial beachheads, the Allies faced the dense Bocage countryside of Normandy. These thick, ancient hedgerows provided perfect defensive positions for the Germans, turning every field and road into a potential ambush site. The battle here was characterized by close-quarters combat, with infantry and tanks struggling to advance through the natural fortifications. To break out of the Normandy beachhead, the Allies launched several major offensives. Operation Epsom, in late June 1944, aimed to encircle Caen from the west. Although it did not achieve its ultimate goal, it succeeded in diverting German attention and forces. Operation Cobra, launched on July 25, 1944 by the U.S. First Army, was a decisive breakthrough. Spearheaded by heavy bombers, the offensive shattered German defenses, allowing American forces to advance rapidly through Brittany. As the Allies pushed forward, they liberated numerous towns and cities. The German defense began to crumble, culminating in the encirclement of German forces in the Falaise pocket in August 1944. This decisive engagement led to the destruction of a significant portion of the German Army Group B, effectively breaking the back of German resistance in Normandy. The liberation of Normandy was greatly aided by the French resistance, who provided invaluable intelligence and carried out sabotage operations against German supply lines. The collaboration between the Allies and the resistance was a testament to the spirit of cooperation that defined the liberation efforts. The Battle of Normandy was a brutal and costly campaign, but it was a strategic triumph for the Allies. By the end of August 1944, the Allies had liberated Paris and were advancing toward the German border. The success of the Normandy invasion set the stage for the eventual defeat of Nazi Germany and the liberation of Europe. The German Response Initially, the German high command was in disarray. Hitler, convinced that the main invasion would come at Pas de Calais, hesitated to commit his panzer divisions to Normandy. This crucial delay allowed the Allies to establish a foothold and bring in reinforcements. Field Marshal Urban Rommel and General Gerd von Rundstedt, the two senior commanders in France, 
had conflicting strategies. Rommel believed that the best chance to repel the invasion was to crush the Allies on the beaches, while Rundstedt favored a more flexible defense, allowing the Allies to advance inland and then counterattacking with armored reserves. This strategic discord further hampered the German response. Despite initial hesitation, the Germans launched several counterattacks to contain the Allied breakout. The most notable of these was Operation Luttich, launched on August 7, 1944, aimed at cutting off the American advance towards Avranche. However, the attack was poorly coordinated and met with stiff Allied resistance, resulting in heavy German losses. The failure of German counterattacks and the rapid Allied advance led to the encirclement of German forces in the Falaise pocket. By mid-August, Allied forces had trapped a significant portion of the German 7th Army and the 5th Panzer Army. Despite desperate attempts to escape, around 50,000 German troops were captured and many more were killed or wounded. This catastrophic loss severely weakened German capabilities in the West. Hitler's reaction to the unfolding disaster was marked by denial and anger. He blamed his generals for the failures and dismissed many high-ranking officers. The German military leadership was in crisis, with morale plummeting and internal divisions deepening. This internal turmoil only benefited the advancing Allied forces. As the Allies advanced, the Germans fell back to defensive lines such as the Siegfried Line, also known as the Westwall, in preparation for the defense of Germany itself. The strategic initiative had firmly shifted to the Allies, with German forces increasingly on the defensive. German civilians, subjected to a relentless barrage of propaganda, were initially unaware of the scale of the defeats. However, as the front lines drew closer to German territory, the reality of the situation became impossible to ignore. The propaganda machines struggled to maintain morale as the Allies continued their relentless push towards Germany. The German response to D-Day and the subsequent Battle of Normandy was marked by strategic blunders, internal conflicts, and an underestimation of Allied capabilities. These factors, combined with the relentless pressure from the advancing Allied forces, led to a series of defeats that severely crippled German defenses in the West. The success of the Normandy campaign paved the way for the liberation of Europe and the eventual fall of Nazi Germany. Conclusion As the dust settled on the battlefields of Normandy, the true scale of the operation became clear. D-Day was not just a turning point in World War II, but a testament to human courage, resilience, and the collective effort of nations united against tyranny. D-Day marked the beginning of the end for Nazi Germany. The successful landings and the subsequent Battle of Normandy were pivotal in breaking the German hold on Western Europe. The operation demonstrated the effectiveness of Allied planning, the bravery of the soldiers, and the crucial role of intelligence and deception. The opening of the Western Front forced the Germans to fight a two-front war, stretching their resources and weakening their defenses. This shift allowed the Soviet Union to launch more effective offensives from the East, hastening the collapse of the Third Reich. The liberation of Paris on August 25, 1944, symbolized the resurgence of freedom in Europe and boosted the morale of occupied nations. D-Day's legacy extends far beyond the battlefield. It showcased the strength of international cooperation with forces from multiple nations working together to achieve a common goal. The courage displayed by the soldiers who stormed the beaches has been immortalized in countless books, films, and memorials, serving as a powerful reminder of the cost of freedom and the enduring spirit of those who fought for it. Today, the beaches of Normandy stand as solemn reminders of the sacrifice and bravery of those who fought there. Memorials and museums preserve the history of D-Day, ensuring that future generations understand the significance of this momentous event. The annual commemorations bring together veterans, their families, and people from around the world to honor those who served and to reflect on the importance of peace and unity. D-Day was a gamble of immense proportions, a daring operation that relied on meticulous planning, sheer bravery, and the will to succeed against overwhelming odds. Its success was a critical step towards the ultimate defeat of Nazi Germany and the restoration of peace in Europe. The story of D-Day is a testament to the resilience of the human spirit and the power of collective action in the face of adversity. As the sun sets over the now peaceful beaches of Normandy, we remember the sacrifices made on that fateful day. D-Day changed the course of history and continues to inspire us to strive for a world where peace and freedom prevail. It stands as a reminder that 
Even in the darkest times, courage and unity can light the path to a brighter future. We honor the memory of those who served and those who gave their lives for the cause of freedom. Their legacy will never be forgotten. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave your thoughts in the comments. Check back in again soon. Salute.